In this lecture, I wish to look at the various philosophies that were practiced by the ruling classes in the Roman world, uh, beginning there. And the two most important were those of Plato, um, whom we will, we'll, which we'll refer to as Platonism, and particularly what came to be called by modern historians as Middle Platonism and Neoplatonism. We'll be encountering those terms in other lectures as well. And uh, how, that is how these, uh, how these uh, doctrines of Plato began to be developed <clears throat> uh, in, by subsequent ages. And then also Stoicism. Uh, there were many practitioners of Stoicism. The Stoics, Stoic doctrines go back to <clears throat> uh, Zeno of Kittium, who, uh, uh, um, who developed these doctrines in the, in the um, third century. And then they would be modified e even, uh, even further after him in the second century. Uh, so much so that really, by the time you get to the Roman period, when we refer to Roman Stoicism, um, it is really kind of, uh, in some ways, a, a, it has quite substantial differences from where it began. Um, same thing went, with, of course, with Plato, too. Neoplatonism is in many ways very different than original Platonism, although the practitioners of Neoplatonism wouldn't have really seen it that way. They saw themselves simply as continuators of the Platonic tradition. <clears throat> there were also, of course, followers of the doctrines of Epicurus, the so-called Epicureans, as well as followers of Pythagoras, the Pythagoreans that went back to the sixth century. Um, and there were other eclectic philosophical schools that pulled from each one of these and combined them. Um, but the main ones though, for the Roman period are Platonism and Stoicism. And probably most people who use philosophy as a moral guide in the Roman world um, were, would be, even if they were eclectics, that is, even if they pulled from various different traditions, they were primarily uh, pulling from those two, rather than um, being strict members of one philosophy or another. There's a great deal of exchange of ideas, of concepts, and of terminology uh, among these various philosophical schools. Now, first and foremost, we must talk about Plato. The American philosopher, Alfred North Whitehead once famously stated that the safest characterization of the entire European philosophical tradition is that it consists of a series of footnotes to Plato. It's a direct quote, a very famous quote. In other words, Plato is the main act and everybody else is just footnotes. Ralph Waldo Emerson, the American transcendentalist, said even more simply, Plato is philosophy and philosophy is Plato. And a third great thinker, the old professor in C.S. Lewis's Chronicles of Narnia, put it so well, it's all in Plato, all in Plato. Dear me, what do they teach them in the schools these days anyway? That, I think, is a pretty good summary of the crucial point for our understanding. The Platonic tradition in Western philosophy is not just one tradition among many or one tradition among many other equally central traditions. It is so much the central one that the very existence and indeed survival of the Western intellectual inheritance depends upon it. It is like the Confucian tradition in Chinese culture or monotheism in the Bible or the human rights tradition in politics. You cannot be a Western thinker and escape Plato. And that is true right on up until our postmodern day when postmodernist thought attacks Plato and uh, wants to get away from him and denigrate him as much as possible, but still nevertheless must begin with him as a matter of um, debate, disagreement, trouble, and I dare to say inspiration. Now, any philosophy is a work of art. And like all great works of art, it must have a central unity. All great works of art have a central unity. Most great philosophers, therefore, usually have one big idea, one central great concept, a kind of hub from which all the other ideas that they produce radiate like spokes. For Plato, this is the so-called theory of ideas or theory of forms, though both of these terms are misleading. For Platonic ideas are not ideas in anybody's head. They are not concepts. 
uh, nor are they forms in the sense of geometrical shapes. They are rather objective truths, objective realities that are not visible to the eye of the body, but only the eye of the mind. However, the mental eye that sees them is not merely the eye of reasoning or intelligence in the narrow modern sense, but rather the eye of contemplation or intellectual intuition. There is a third reason why it is misleading to call Plato's doctrine the theory of forms or the theory of ideas, platonic ideas, because it is not a theory of all, at all. It is an insight, and that's actually what the word theoria in Greek means, a vision. It is a sudden, almost mystical experience. Mystical in the sense that it is an insight into something absolute, but not in the sense of being irrational. It is, in fact, supremely rational. Now, I've spoken about it quite generally. Let me get specific. This single big idea that characterizes the philosophy of Platonism could be called the theory of big ideas, because the Platonic ideas are bigger than any ideas inside of our minds, and also they are bigger than concrete material things outside of our minds. They're bigger than both of us. They are bigger or realer than either concepts or things. And this, if you, it's in the notes, but you may want to make a further note of it. The Platonic ideas or forms are the standards or patterns of all concepts and all natural things. Okay, I will say that again. Platonic forms are the standards or patterns of all concepts and all things. Okay, so in other words, if I asked you to define justice for me, well, justice is when maybe you might say it's when a guilty person uh, gets convicted of a crime and goes to jail. They get the, they get punished according to in proportion to what they've done. Well. Plato would say, well, that's an example of justice, yet that is not justice itself. Justice as an eternal paradigm must have existed before that instance of it in order for us to be able to say that that is a just, that is a just moment. In other words, the platonic idea or paradigm or essence of justice has always existed, and it is the standard by which we can judge the imperfect versions of things here on earth. And these... Platonic perfections, standards, patterns, paradigms, however you want to call them, they account for the unity between concepts and things. So, for instance, if we're going to continue with that idea of justice, uh, you can see another action and say, okay, that is less than just, that is an imperfect form of justice. Uh, but this one is just, and this example is just, and that example is just. All of these multiplicities of different instances of justice can all be grouped together under the category of justice, because there is one overarching idea, one overarching principle to all of them. But it works with other things too, anything based, any concept or anything, as I said, in the natural world. Squareness, humanness. There are 7 billion people on the planet. We all look very different. We all have very different things about our physical um, appearances and uh, the things that make us up our DNA, and yet we are all human beings because there is one essential human nature. There is a form in the Platonic sense of human nature. And to the degree that things correspond on earth to those eternal paradigms, we can call them just things or square things or human things. But only because both our ideas and those that th those things that participate in the same uh, in those forms uh, do in fact share in justice with a capital J, squareness with a capital S, and humanness with a capital H. Let me put it to you another way, and this apparently was the thing that prompted Plato to have this big insight. It came from geometry. Okay, if I were to draw a triangle at this point, if we were meeting live, I would be drawing one on this on the board right now. Now. It would be a bad triangle because I'm very bad at drawing. And yet you would be able to recognize that it is a triangle. But how is it that you can recognize that it's a triangle if it was a bad one? Well, because you have some kind of mental idea, mental vision of the absolute triangle, triangleness with a capital T. Okay. And, you, and even if I were to make the most perfect triangle, 
in you know computer generated image that has you know no overlap no whatever nevertheless that triangle came into being at some point and it could be deleted it could pass out of being when i hit delete um yet triangleness never came into being and nor can it ever pass away even if you got rid of all triangles on earth triangleness would still exist okay this is the big idea of Plato. This is what platonic forms are. Now, this big idea of Plato is most famously expressed in his work called The Republic, the single most famous book in the history of philosophy. Books, of course, become famous and read because they are loved. And The Republic is loved not for its politics, which are absurd, but because of its psychology. And above all, for one short passage, which is the most famous in the whole history of philosophy, the so-called parable of the cave or allegory of the cave, in which Plato invites us to come with him out of our small, comfortable, conventional little shadow land into a startlingly larger world outside this cave and to see those ultimate realities of which these shadows are mere shadows, mere reflections of the eternal paradigm. And when we do that, we will certainly at first be confused and blink and squint as when we first see the sunlight. And the reaction of, of ours might, uh, to Plato's theory of ideas might typically be like that of Horatio to Hamlet when he first sees the ghost whom he did not previously believe in. And while Horatio is in a dazed state of mind, Hamlet says to him, there are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than are dreamed of in your philosophy. And what I would like to do now for you is to play a small little uh, animation of, uh, of, the, of <clears throat> the allegory of the cave being read none, by none other than Orson Welles, actually, in the 1960s, with a wonderful uh, animation accompanying it that I think will drive the point home very nicely. OK, and um, I think you'll you'll be able to understand it very well afterwards. <clears throat> Let me show in a parable to what extent our nature is enlightened or unenlightened. Envision human figures living in an underground cave with a long entrance across the whole width of the cave. Here they have been from their childhood and have their legs and necks chained so that they cannot move and can only see before them, being prevented by the chains from turning their heads around. Above and behind them, a fire is blazing at a distance. They see only their own shadows, which the fire throws on the opposite wall of the cave. For how could they see anything but the shadows if they were never allowed to move their heads? Between the fire and the prisoners, there is a raised way and a low wall built along the way like the screen which puppet players have in front of them over which they show the puppets. Do you see men passing along the wall, carrying all sorts of articles which they hold projected above the wall? Statues of men and animals made of wood and stone and various materials? Of the objects which are being carried in like manner, they would only see the shadows. And if they were able to converse with one another, would they not suppose that they were naming what was actually before them? And suppose further that there was an echo which came from the wall. Would they not be sure to think when one of the passers-by spoke that the voice came from the passing shadows? To them, the truth would be literally nothing but the shadows of the images. 
And now look again and see what will naturally follow if one of the prisoners is released. At first, when he is liberated and compelled suddenly to stand up and turn his head round and look towards the light, all this would hurt him and he would be much too dazzled to see distinctly those things whose shadows he had seen before. And then conceive someone saying to him that what he saw before was an illusion. But that now, when he's approaching nearer to reality and his eyes turn toward more real existence, he has a clearer vision. What will be his reply? And you may further imagine that his instructor is pointing to the objects as they pass and requiring him to name them. Will he not be perplexed? Will he not think that the shadows which he formerly saw are truer than the objects which are now shown to him? And suppose once more that he is reluctantly dragged up a steep and rugged ascent and held fast until he is forced into the presence of the sun himself. When he approaches the light, his eyes will be dazzled, and he will not be able to see anything at all of what are now called realities. He will require to grow accustomed to the sight of the upper world. And first he will see the shadows best. Next, the reflections of objects in the water, and then the objects themselves. Then he will gaze upon the stars and the spangled heavens and the light of the moon. He will see the sky and the stars by night. Last of all, he will be able to see the sun. And not mere reflections of it in the water, but he will see the sun in its own proper place and not in another. And he will contemplate the sun as it is. Will he not then proceed to argue that it is the sun who gives the season and the years and is the guardian of all that is in the visible world and in a certain way the cause of all things which his fellows have been accustomed to behold? Clearly he would first see the sun and then reason about it. And when he remembered his old habitation and what was the wisdom of the cave and his fellow prisoners, do you not suppose that he would bless himself for the change and pity them? And if they were in the habit of conferring honors among themselves on those who were the quickest to observe the passing shadows, and to remark which of them went before and which followed after, and which were together and who were therefore best able to draw conclusions as to the future. Do you think that he would care for such honors and glories or envy the possessors of them? Would he not say with Homer, better to be the poor servant of a poor master and to endure anything rather than think as they do and live after their manner. Imagine once more such a one coming suddenly out of the sun to be replaced in his old situation. Would he not be certain to have his eyes full of darkness? And if there were a contest of measuring the shadows and he had to compete with the prisoners who had never moved out of the den, while his sight was still weak, and before his eyes had become steady, wouldn't they all laugh at him and say he had spoiled his eyesight by going up there? That it was better not to even think of ascending? <laughs> and if anyone tried to release another and lead him up to the light, let them only catch the offender and they would put him to death. It is the task of the enlightened not only to ascend to learning and to see the good, 
but to be willing to descend again to those prisoners and to share their troubles and their honors, whether they are worth having or not. And this they must do, even with the prospect of death. They shall give of their help to one another, wherever each class is able to help the community. So there you have it, the most famous moment of all Western philosophy given to you in less than eight minutes. <laughs> now, obviously, this is there's a lot here to talk about. But the essential concept, the essential point of Platonism is this idea of moreness, of transcendence, of another kind of reality outside of our cave. We can define this transcendence in, or this essential idea in three different ways, either very broadly, very narrowly, or somewhere in between those two extremes. Very broadly means what the Greeks would, have co would call at other times logos, and what we might translate as rational order. That is, reality has an internal order, an intelligibility, a system, that it makes sense, and that order is not just our invention, our minds imposing structure and meaning onto uh, an otherwise meaningless uh, existence, but rather that meaning is really there in everything. In, in, in an ethical framework, it would mean that it is that things that are evil are actually evil, not that there's just something that it's a person's idea. Something that is good is really good. It's not just somebody's idea about that. Things are discovered rather than invented. Things are ordered because they have intelligible natures or essences. This is the essential meaning of, of all of Platonism. And indeed, I would say it, it was the default perspective on reality really until the modern age that begins at the French Revolution in 1789. Uh, since then, of course, the default mentality for most people has been the exact opposite of that, nominalism, that there is no such thing as a nature, that there is no truly good or bad in anything. It is just whatever we call it. There is no nature for anything that a person um, can change their nature into something else simply by identifying as one thing or another, that there is no set nature to anything. But not so for Platonism. The primary question, what is it, has real answers for Plato. Reality is intelligible to mind, being is open to reason, and reason is open to being. And this, in philo philosophical terms, we would call the ontological way of defining Platonism. Uh, ontology means the study of what actually is, first philosophy, what is the nature of reality. And it is the broad way of defining the platonic forms. The narrow way of defining platonic forms is the way most history of te philosophy textbooks do it, which is to say that there are always universals over particulars, or to use a beloved phrase of, of uh, subsequent age, a, there is always a one over the many. That is to say, redness, justice, chairness uh, are all just as real as red things, just things, or chairs. Maybe I won't use the word, I won't use chair as an example because that is a human invention. And I don't personally believe that platonic forms are uh, extend to human creations, but things only in the natural world. But nevertheless, the point that I'm trying to make is that adjectives are just as real as nouns are. That when two or more things have the same quality, let's say beauty, that quality is as real as the things themselves. And in fact, it is realer than those things because those things come into being and perish away. Men per come into being and perish. Justice, an act of justice uh, uh, comes into being and passes away, but justice itself or human nature always exists. Okay? If one were to go around and were to depopulate the whole planet, human nature would still exist 
okay, justice would still exist, even though it were not to be found anywhere on earth, okay? Again, think of beauty. The idea that, um, you know, you look at a beautiful uh, sunset, or you look at uh, a baby's face, or you hear a Beethoven piano sonata. Those are all beautiful, but they're all very, very different, aren't they? Um, but the fact that we can lump in all of those many things into one category is because that one category of beauty truly exists and is partaken of by all of the particular instances of it. A third definition of Plato's theory of forms is that visible concrete particular things are images or reflections of their pure forms or platonic ideas, essences is what I like to call them. And this is what is meant by the philosophical term metaphysics, if you've heard that term before. Metaphysics, simply put, is the notion that there is something like true being, not merely apparent being, uh, true being that is, that is somehow beneath or behind or within or above the apparent being of the appearances of this world. Particular things are like real things or analogous to them, but they are imperfect versions of them. You see, think of my triangle example before. The world which we see here in our cave is a series of shadows of more real things, okay? The whole world we see is an image of the world we do not see, as a painting is an image first and foremost in the painter's mind and only then on the canvas. When we see a painting, our mind forms an image of it. But the painting itself is an, an image of an idea within the artist's own mind. Now, what we're going to see here is obviously, even though this is pre-Christian uh, philosophy, it very easily will be able to be Christianized, okay? Because the easiest way to understand this, and I would even go so far as to say the, 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 the perfection of this understanding, is to think of the painter, if we want to continue that analogy, as God. The painting is the universe, so that the whole material universe is a great work of art. And our understanding of the principles of that, of beauty, of justice, and goodness, and all the rest of it, um, are reflections that we see in this physical world of the divine archetypes that are in the mind of God. Now, if you're saying to yourself, well, that sounds heretical, Kyle, uh, <laughs> let me just hasten to quote for you none other than the Apostle Paul in his epistle to the Romans, chapter 1, verse 20, where he says, quote, the invisible things of him, meaning God, the invisible things of God are clearly seen from the creation of the world, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. Okay, so we can see and learn something of the divine mind by looking at the created things, by the things that are made. Now, I have used the language of the Bible because it makes Platonism clear, even though Platonism in, in and of itself is not religion. And certainly the authors of the New Testament did not superimpose Platonic ideas into their writing of scripture. My point rather is that Platonic, this Platonic insight is one of universal scope. It is true and thus finds resonances within the texts uh, that do not directly partake of its tradition. But nevertheless, uh, Plato and certainly um, Aristotle after him, and I would probably uh, even connect that with Socrates too, were all monotheists. They all uh, were agnostic really about the divine mind. They, they nowhere make very definitive statements about God, but they do make some statements about God. Of course, the most, the most uh, particular one that comes to mind is Aristotle's description of the unmoved mover. The, the divine, the, the, the God that is, that the entire universe moves towards out of love and therefore kind of is the, the primary cause of all things, the uncaused cause. Of course, a true understanding of God belongs to the revelation of Christianity as the church fathers will later say. Um, uh, but nevertheless, you can see already, even in my way of describing it, a kind of copacetic-ness between the platonic insights and, uh, and Christian faith, okay? And that is something that we're going to see a lot of as time goes on um, 
in, uh, in, in our course. Now, of course, one last point to make about this is that yes, the higher world, the realm of the eternal forms, those things are the, are, are, are the things that are perfect, those ideas in the mind of God, those platonic forms. But the things of this world are not only temporal and changing, but they're also imperfect, okay? Uh, roundness as a principle is obviously the, the, the platonic form, but every round thing in this world is gonna be a little bit bumpy. Every just thing in this world will be a little bit unjust. But to take my example before, if we were to say that justice is a guilty man being punished for his crime, yet we, any form of human justice can never fully take into account all the other mitigating factors maybe that that person had experienced as a child that traumatized him, that predisposed him to committing that criminal act that he did. Uh, and you know the just the sentences that are meted out will never truly be able to uh, be commensurate with with the crime that was committed. So justice and everything else in this world is always going to be an imperfect version of the true divine perfection. Um, you might say that that's a kind of pessimistic way of looking at this world, and indeed you'd be correct. There is built into the Platonic insight of reality a certain degree of pessimism, that this world is a shadow land, this world is imperfect, and can never be otherwise, regardless of whatever utopias uh, modern man tries to create for himself. Okay, now, um, these basic assumptions, and these basic ideas um, are fleshed out in a lot of Plato's works. Plato is actually the only author from antiquity whose work has essentially survived in full. He's the only writer from antiquity whose works we have all of. And um, in his Timaeus myth, uh, he describes the creation of the universe by a divine demiurge. Again, a very monotheistic way of looking at things. His, his, it, it is different in some important ways from um, the creator God envisioned in the book of Genesis, in the, uh, particularly because for Plato, the divine demiurge, the creator god of the universe, uses the forms as kind of blueprints for his creation. So that the reason why this world is going to be an imperfect version of those divine archetypes is because those things are like the blueprints. And you know, when you actually put a blueprint into a real building, it's never going to be as perfect as the as the plan was it always is going to be some kind of uh you know something lower it will, it will never be quite as perfect as the ideal uh that is not that is a very different concept than what is found in christianity of course christianity will explain the imperfection uh present in the universe as being the result of sin uh that originally the universe and everything created on earth was very good as the book of genesis says but but then human sin brought evil and death into the world. So that is an important dis distinction. Um, in, the year, in the centuries subsequent to Plato, his philosophy uh, underwent certain changes, uh, particularly in the, and this period is known as middle Platonism. Particularly the differences were that Platonism began to mix slightly with other philosophies and be influenced by others, such as uh, such as Aristotelian philosophy and, uh, and others, uh, Pythagoreanism, and even Stoicism itself, which we're going to learn about in a moment. And it is this blending of different philosophical strains uh, or the application of Platonism to other traditions that constitute the hallmark of middle Platonism. Um, uh, for instance, um, Plutarch of Chironia, uh, who was a Roman citizen, but a Greek Roman, uh, wrote in Greek, and just a wonderful, humane kind of person, the sort of person you would like to have at a dinner party or something, he just knew all these wonderful stories. He wrote tons of biographies of famous Greeks and Romans and moral treatises, all sorts of things. Um, but he used Platonism as a way of understanding the traditional um, cultic practices of Greco-Roman paganism and its myths. He reinterpreted these things in the light these kind of brutish and, uh, you know, very sometimes um, 
uh, obscene myths of, of the Greeks. He reinterpreted them through a kind of platonic guise and that enabled him to sort of find deeper meanings in the traditional religion. So for instance, he, um, he wrote uh, an essay on Serapis and Isis in which he reinterpreted the Egyptian myth uh, which entailed the combat between Osiris and his brother god Seth, the evil god of the desert, um, and how Seth kills Osiris and cuts him up into pieces. Isis, the wife uh, and sister of Osiris, assembles the parts again and reassembles her husband, uh, who then goes to the underworld as the lord of justice. Well, all of this kind of crazy obscene myth, and, and I'm sure you know, you've read plenty of Greek mythology in your lives, you know that there's plenty of stuff like this. Well, he, Plutarch reinterprets this all as a platonic allegory in which Osiris, who, who uh, another name for Osiris in the, in the Greco-Roman version, it would be Serapis. Uh, Osiris or Serapis represents the noetic realm. This is the term that Plato described, the noetic or intelligible realm, this, um, the world of the forms. And um, the yearning, uh, he also this, this also represents the yearning to understand those uh, divine essences, those eternal things. And Seth, the evil god, represents the physical world, the world of becoming, of um, uh, what in Greek is called togignostai, uh, the, the, the world of uh, coming into being and passing away, the physical world holding us back. See, Platonism is very dualistic. It really, Socrates would even say, and of course it's really Plato through the mouth of Socrates, um, uh, Socrates never wrote anything. Plato used Socrates as a kind of character in his dialogues. Um, Plato uh, would have Socrates say that the body is the prison of the soul, and that um, you know the, the physical is 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 what holds us back from the spiritual. This also will be a distinct uh, difference from Christianity, uh, which will see the body ultimately as a good, but just one that must be regulated and brought under subjection of the soul. Um, but not so for Platonism. Platonism really sees the body as a negative. Um, and uh, now, so anyway, the point though in all this is that Plutarch is able to use Platonism uh, as a kind of allegory, as an al allegorical sort of guise to the interpretation of these ancient myths. And, and it is important to note that Plutarch himself was a priest um, of Demeter and uh, Persephone, at the at Eleusis near, near Athens, those Eleusinian mysteries that we talked about. So, um, when you read Plutarch, what you see is a person who is totally at home, taking part in the traditional cults and religious practices of paganism, and yet using philosophy as a kind of way of interpreting those cults as, into a higher reality, as allegorical, as symbolic, and therefore worthy of perpetuation and study philosophy. Thus, I think we could use him as a kind of paradigm uh, for the upper classes in general, that philosophy thus for the upper classes um, was a way of coming to terms and understanding, a way of giving new moral interpretation to the traditional cults and myths as uh, which they had been taught as children. Now, Another individual who I'm going to talk a lot more about later on this evening, um, but I'll just mention here right now, who is kind of a the exhibit A of Middle Platonism. Um, his name is Philo of Alexandria. He is a Jew writing in Alexandria. And you have to remember that Alexandria is a Greek city that happens to be in Egypt. It's not really an Egyptian city. It's really a Greek intellectual center. And there, Philo writing in Greek, use the doctrines of Plato to understand his own Jewish faith. In many ways, Philo is a pivotal figure because he shows how Platonic philosophy can be divorced from the worship of the traditional gods and applied to, uh, to monotheism. And many Christian authors will take, uh, uh, take, a, take a leaf from Philo's book, will look to Philo as an example in that direction. Platonism was probably the most common philosophy in terms of numbers in the Roman world. Uh, and as I said, I would even go so far as, as to say it was sort of the default mentality, even for people of, uh, who maybe never studied philosophy. Um, it was definitely sort of the way that, oh, in which reality was interpreted, that, that behind the physical, there is an, an eternal meaning that there is a true essence and nature to things. 
and that it is not just human minds imposing order upon otherwise meaningless brute matter. Of course, in, in so far as it was practiced um, in the Greek speaking half of the Roman Empire, uh, it would have been eclectic during this middle period uh, as a moral system and overall discipline. Um, all literate uh, people, uh, both, both East and West would have been familiar with Plato. They would have all read Plato. Um, certainly in terms of the literary quality of the style and the grammar, but also pl platonic doctrines tended to prevail, especially in the Eastern half of the Roman Empire. Um, they begin to come to Rome in the second century AD. Uh, I mean, the, the specifically the city of Rome. And there's a lot of speculation about this. Um, but the simple explanation for this is that starting in the mid second century AD, many more Roman senators, as the Senate became open to provincials, men of wealth and rank from the provinces who became Roman senators, many of them came from the provinces of Asia, that is Western, uh, that is Asia Minor or Turkey, modern day Turkey, from Syria and from Greece. And so the popularity of Platonism in the city of Rome in the second and third centuries AD really re begins to reflect the changing makeup of the Roman aristocratic class, which uh, you know, becomes something of, a, of an imperial aristocracy. And if the imperial aristocracy has more people of Greek origin, obviously they're going to, to bring in Platonism. Okay. The other philosophy, uh, that we need to talk about is Stoicism. Okay, these are the doctrines that go back to the Stoic teacher Zeno of Citium, and also a man named Chrysippus, uh, who were both writing in the third century BC. Now, as I said before, Roman Stoicism is an adaptation of Greek Stoicism. Um, the Greek version of Stoicism, going back to Zen Zeno, um, had a lot of very complicated cosmology. Uh, there's an enormous amount of physics and mathematics. Um, that sort of thing didn't really appeal to the old fashioned kind of, you know, down to business Romans were very practical. Um, and so when the Romans first encountered Stoicism in the second century BC, they didn't really know what to make of it. In fact, there's a, there's a very famous story of Cato the, the Elder, who you can just take a look at his face there. I mean, what a, what a sourpuss. Um, Marcus Porcius Cato the Elder, this con arch conservative of the Roman Republic. He was the one, if you're familiar for, with Roman history, that used to end every one of his speeches with the phrase, Carthago delenda est, and Carthage must be destroyed. Well, when he, because he, he just hated Carthage, and, and he, you know, no matter what he was talking about in the Senate, you know, there are too many stray dogs in the Rome, and Carthage must be destroyed. Um, but when the Greek philosophers came to Rome, he basically ran them out of town and he thought that this sort of thing would just absolutely corrupt the, the minds of the, you know, the good old fashioned moral Romans, the simple uh, and, and courageous Romans. Well, eventually Stoic doctrines did become quite popular in Rome. And that is because later Stoicism realized that the Romans were far more interested in morality and the practical side of philosophy rather than, you know, mathematical explanations of the cosmos and so on. And one of the most important figures behind this transference is a man named Posidonius, writing in the second and first century BC, um, who made Roman Stoicism popular. He's kind of a cultural middleman in some ways. He was a Greek, but he also floated among um, Roman circles. And, and of course, all the upper classes of Rome all spoke Greek, very much like, uh, say, the Roman, I'm sorry, the Russian uh, upper classes of the 18th and 19th centuries all spoke French. Uh, it was something like that. They really prized Greek culture. And, uh, and, and all were bilingual. Well, in the later Roman Stoic doctrines, um, the, main, uh, the main focus was on this doctrine of logos. Now, this is an, a doctrine that the Stoics had originally taken over from a early, much earlier philosopher named Heraclitus, who talked about the principle of logos. And as I said before, logos has many meanings. If you were to look it up in an ancient Greek dictionary, it has like three pages of definitions. But the essential meaning is reason. It is where our word logic comes from. It can also mean word, And um, but what is a word? A word is an articulation, an expression of what our thought is, right? what our reasoning is. Um, and so logos ultimately, it, it really means reason or, or rationality. And for the Stoics, as for Heraclitus before him, before them, 
the whole universe was undergirded by a divine rationality. Uh, the reason why the laws of the universe are open to the study of scientists, the reason why every day is exactly the same length uh, as the next and the one before it, the reason why the birds fly south in the wintertime and north in the summertime, uh, the reason why every even contemptible little blade of grass is made with such perfection is because <clears throat> there is divine logos undergirding everything, okay? Now, ultimately, this divine logos will be associated with the second person of the Holy Trinity uh, in the beginning of St. John's Gospel. In the beginning was the word, the Greek for which is anarchy in on logos, okay? In the beginning, was the word was the logos and and that identification that this is not just a principle of divine rationality but indeed a person that will be that will come with the revelation of christianity but the stoics in some ways have the same intuition and they work out this idea that the physical world is in some way undergirded even a manifestation of divine reason of divine rationality and Wisdom, therefore, being a true philosopher, is to essentially let go of the reins and let the divine logos guide you wherever it will. That's why the term stoic in English means somebody who's capable of enduring pain without flinching, uh, right? When we say somebody goes to the dentist and deals with it stoically, it means that they, you know, grin and bear it. But uh, that's, a, that's kind of a, a major, um, uh, you know, simple oversimplification of what, what the Stoics really meant. What they meant was allowing God to work through your life, <clears throat> allowing the divine logos to guide you and to not be peeved about all the things that you cannot control. There are some things, indeed, that you can control, and there are many, 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 many things that you cannot control. And wisdom is not getting those two things confused. Because ultimately, you cannot control very much in your life, the Stoics would say. You, you would say, maybe, what are you talking about? I can control my health, for sure. If I work out and I'm moderate in my intake, I don't smoke or something like that. Well, then, yes, yes, you can do all those things. But if everybody could be healthy that wants to be, surely most people would be. And yet there are things that are totally outside of our control, like cancer, even our own genetics to some degree, uh, you know, play a, play a great role in our health and they are totally outside of our control. And of course, accidents can happen. So our intentions, our own actions are, we, we can do, we can change those, but the outcome we really cannot. In the same way, um, you could say, well, what about my wealth? I'm gonna work hard, I'm gonna get a degree, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make a lot of money. Well, okay, you can definitely do all those things, but. If everybody could be rich that wants to be, surely most people would be rich. And indeed, that is not the case. So again, it's the same kind of thing. Cicero, who is very eclectic and borrows from Stoicism a lot, he compares this to shooting an arrow. He said, even a great archer uh, can miss the mark if a gust of wind blows. It's the same kind of way with our lives. We have maybe 10% under our control. Our motivations, our goals, our aversions, our desires, our reactions to the things that happen to us, those are under our control, but the outcomes are not, okay? And, and wisdom means not getting those two categories confused. So remember that next time you're stuck in traffic and you're late for <laughs> wherever you have to go, a stoic person will just grin and bear it because getting upset about it is not, is not gonna change anything, not under your control. There is a very, very beautiful hymn that is expressed in this regard by one of the early figures in Stoicism, Cleanthes, who came after Chrysippus. <clears throat> and it is his hymn to Zeus. Now, I want you to pay close attention to this because he identifies the Zeus, the, I'm sorry, he identifies Zeus with the Logos. And that is a very interesting thing because um, if you read early Greek philosophy, I'm sorry, if you read early Greek mythology, uh, for instance, like the Iliad or something like that, you know that Zeus is running around fornicating with everything that moves. Um, he's certainly nothing like the, um, you know, the, the, the principle of rationality in the universe, for goodness sake. And yet, under the influence of philosophy, as just as we, as we saw with uh, Plutarch, these 
upper classes, these intellectuals among the Greeks and Romans used philosophy as a way of kind of reinterpreting traditional religion and traditional myths and so on. So as to find, you know, kind of giving them a new philosophical guise. He's really not talking about the Zeus of mythology anymore. Just listen and you'll see. Oh God, most glorious, called by many a name, nature's great king through endless years the same. Omnipotence who by your just decree controls all. Hail Zeus, for unto you must your creatures in all lands fall. We are your children, we alone of all on earth's broad ways that wander to and fro, bearing your image wherever we go. Wherefore, with songs of praise, your power I will proclaim. Look, yonder heaven, that round the earth is wheeled, follows your guidance, still to you does yield glad homage. Your unconquerable hand, such flaming minister, the heftless brand wields a sword two-edged whose deathless might pulsates through all that nature brings to light. Vehicle of the universal word, of course, the word here would be logos, that flows through all and in the light celestial glows of stars, both great and small. A king of kings through ceaseless ages, God, whose purpose, purpose brings to birth whatever on land or in the sea is wrought or in high heaven's immensity, save what the sinner works infatuate. No, but you know how to make the crooked straight. Chaos to you is order. In your eyes, the unloved is lovely. Who did harmonize things evil with things good, that there should be one word, one logos, through all things everlasting. One logos, whose voice, alas, the wicked spurn, insatiate for the good their spirits yearn. Yet seeing, see not, neither hearing, hear, God's universal law, which those revere by reason guided, happiness who win. The rest unreasoning, diverse shapes of sin, self-prompted follow. For an idle name, vainly they wrestle in the contests of fame. Others inordinately riches court, or dissolute the joys of flesh pursue. Now here, now there, they wander, fruitless still, forever seeking good and finding ill. Zeus, the all-bountiful, whom darkness shrouds, whose lightning lightens in the thunder clouds, your children save from error's deadly sway. Turn you the darkness from their souls away. Vouchsafe that unto knowledge they attain, for you by knowledge are made strong to reign over all, and all things rule righteously. So by you honored, we will honor thee, praising your works continually with songs, as mortals should nor higher reward belongs even to the gods than justly to adore the universal law forevermore. Okay, so there you have it, my friends. This is Roman Stoicism. Happiness as Epictetus. Epictetus, by the way, one of my absolute favorite among the Stoic philosophers. He was actually a crippled slave. He was beaten so badly by his master that he was crippled. And ultimately, when he was given his freedom later in life, he started his own school of you know, literally a kind of like, like a storefront where students would come in and, um, and learn philosophy from him. Uh, he wrote two works. Actually, one of them was written by one of his students, the, um, the Enchiridion, which is kind of like, a, like his book of maxims and stuff. There's the Enchiridion or handbook, and then another one called the Discourses, which is the, the more expansive of those two. But this is the kind of quote he would say, happiness and freedom begin with a clear understanding of one principle. Some things are within your control and some things are not. There are things which are within your, our power and there are things which are beyond our power. Within our power are opinion, aim, desire, aversion, and in a word, whatever affairs are our own. Beyond our power is our body, property, reputation, office, in a word whatsoever are not properly our own affairs. Now the things within our power are by nature free, unrestricted, unhindered, but those beyond our power are weak, dependent, restricted, and alien. Remember then that if you attribute freedom to things by nature dependent and take what things belongs to others as your own, you will be hindered, you will, be, you will lament, you will be disturbed. You will find fault both with, both with God and men. But if you take for our own, I'm sorry, for your own, only that which is your own and view what belongs to others just as it really is, then no one will ever compel you. No one will restrict you. 
You will find fault with no one. You will accuse no one. You will do nothing against your will. No one will hurt you. You will not have an enemy, nor will you suffer any harm. This, of course, this is what the Stoics would refer to as apatheia. It is, of course, where our word apathy comes from, but it is um, so much more than apathy. Um, it, is, it is quite far from that idea. It is resigning oneself to the divine logos. And so that whatever position you're brought into, whether you are a slave like Epictetus, or you are uh, an emperor like Marcus Aurelius, who was also a Stoic philosopher, nevertheless, you can conduct yourself well. And that's all that really matters. Your own moral actions are the, are the only thing that you really have of, of, of truly control over, okay? Now, obviously you can tell with, with, with all of this, Stoics would tend to be conservative, dutiful, um, and that would appeal to the ruling classes, no doubt about it. There's something obviously in, uh, tremendously attractive about that for any of us. Um, I've always found the Stoics to be incredibly motivating, incredibly inspiring. And in fact, there is a small cottage industry right now of Stoic principle self-help books, which goes a little bit too far and they probably, you know, if you're, if you're gonna reduce this incredibly profound philosophy to a, a series of life hacks, obviously, you know, you're going to ruin it. But um, anyway, you can see the why, why there's even the potential for that in the things that I've said. Now, in terms of numbers, it's hard to define how many Romans were really Stoics or even, you know, doctrinaire, card-carrying Stoics. As I said before, most of them were probably eclectics. That is, they picked from a number of philosophies. There were probably many more Platonists because there are a lot more people in the eastern half of the empire, a lot more literate classes there. But the men who were Roman Stoics were definitely of the ruling class. The men who made the Republic what it was and continued to run the Roman imperial government for almost 250 years afterwards. Especially when you have the reign of the emperors and you had you know, so many, it, the first century AD in terms of emperors was just like a freak show. You, know, you have Caligula, you have Nero, you have Domitian, you have all these bad guys. And yet as the Roman historian Tacitus, who was very much a Stoic, said, and who lived during that time, Boni viri su principibus malis vir reposunt. Good men are capable of living under bad emperors. And it is the doctrines of the, uh, of the Stoics that helped people find their duty and do their duty during these difficult times. Roman Stoics in the Imperial Age um, served out of an obligation to family, to patriotism, to a divine sense, uh, that they were put where they were at that moment in history to do a certain duty and to do it well. And therefore, you know, to custom, they were believers in the ancient mores, the most maiorum, the ancestral uh, customs justified um, by these Stoic doctrines. And, uh, you know, you get figures like Publius Clodius Thrasea Paetus, who was a, um, a Stoic a practitioner of Stoicism under the Emperor Nero, who refused to lick the boots of Nero, as it were, and actually stood up against Nero and, and in the Senate and denounced him and showed a tremendous amount of courage for it and, and of course was forced to commit suicide. And in fact, he and, both, and his wife were both forced to commit suicide. And there's even a beautiful story that describes that how when they were forced to commit suicide, he, the, at, in that last moment, Paetus was kind of, his courage was failing him. It's not an easy thing to drive a sword through one's chest in the Roman fashion. And uh, at that, his wife, who was condemned with him, took up the sword and in the Roman style, threw herself down on the floor upon it, running herself through. And her last words were words of encouragement to her husband. And he, she said, Paite non dolet. Paetus, it doesn't hurt. And uh, with that, she died. Anyway, so he was part of the, what is known as the Stoic resistance to Nero inside of the Senate. Um, and uh, virtue is all important for Stoicism. That's really the crucial point to understand. Service is all important. Dutiful worship of the gods is all important. That would be a part of it too, to connect it back with what we were talking about. Um, Greeks, 
as I mentioned before, Polybius, we're astonished at how dutiful, how pious the Romans were about their cults, how they maintained their rights and uh, what they believed to be the relationship with their gods, how the Roman legal language, in fact, was shot through with um, religious language. The two are indistinguishable, really. Um, when a Roman would offer prayers, it, were, it was almost like a legal document. The Romans um, very much had to get the right name of the god, you know, and all of its different uh, epithets and so on, and they had to do everything correctly so that there was no, you know, no mistake about it. And, um, you know, to kind of finish up with this, uh, with this idea, I mentioned before, Marcus Aurelius in his meditations, his book, he wrote this book as a private diary. The word that is the title of meditations is actually a mistranslation. It really is proseoton, which simply means to himself. And he wrote it while he was freezing himself in, in the uh, battling the Germans in the northern Danube frontier during the 160s and 170s. And he really brings forth some of the basic principles of Roman Stoicism and, um, uh, and how it merges so effortlessly with Roman senses of piety and duty. Um, you know, the, the disdain for luxury um, and the, the taking upon oneself of one's duty, even in very difficult cir circumstances. Um, Stoics tend to, to value uh, a life of action as a, over against a life of contemplation, which would be more the Platonic tradition. Okay. And later on, you will have Christians who were formerly Stoics in their life, like Tertullian, who we talked about before, the Roman jurist, who then became a Christian and became you know, a great Christian writer in Latin. And he will carry over a lot of the attitudes and a lot of the disposition of his prior life, of his Stoicism. And he will see it very much as a piece uh, of a piece with Christianity. Okay. The whole sense of duty and, uh, and piety. So there was really no contradiction there for a lot of these, um, uh, for, for, later, for, for later Christian converts. Um, now, we, we must understand that to a large degree in our modern day age, we look at philosophy and religion as being in conflict with one another. But there really was no contradiction here. The vast majority of them would, of, of, of Greeks and Romans, even if they were practitioners of philosophy, would still absolutely partake in the traditional cults. Uh, there, was, there was nothing, it was, one was not a substitute for the other. And that's, uh, I think, a very important point to make. Um, okay. We will be learning more and seeing more of these philosophers as time goes on. Um, uh, We've been talking exclusively about men uh, as being pr practitioners of philosophy, but there were women too. In fact, that was the principle of Platonism and Stoicism for that matter, that men and women are both equally rational and therefore can both fruitfully study philosophy. We will learn later on at the uh, beginning of the fifth century AD of a woman named Hypatia in Alexandria, a very important Neoplatonist philosopher um, who was a member of the upper class who had the traditional paideia or education and who became what was known as a scholarch or a kind of um, who ran a platonic academy. And these sort of platonic academies, these schools of philosophy would be all over the empire, but particularly in the major urban centers of Athens, Alexandria, Antioch, and Rome. Um, okay. Now, let's, uh, let's transition a little bit because I have a lot more things to talk about tonight. And I don't, well, I don't want to take up too much of our time. There are some things that I didn't mention that are in the notes that you can, of course, um, read on your own. But now I would like to transition, if you're following along with the notes, uh, to page seven. I'd like to now transition over to um, Jews in the Roman Empire. What I plan to do is to introduce Judaism uh, in the Roman world to you. And there are three reasons for doing this. The first, of course, is that Judaism constituted a very important faith in the Roman Empire, and there were many Jews in the Roman Empire. Some would estimate as perhaps as high as 10% of the total population of the empire were Jews by the first century AD. And the second reason for dealing with Judaism is that it is important to understand the emergence of Christianity, uh, as we will be in the upcoming lectures, because Christianity emerges out of Judaism. Uh, St. Paul of uh, of Tarsus, of course, will, uh, is impossible to understand without understanding his Jewish background. 
And third of all, the Romans themselves dealt with the Jews on various levels. Uh, legally, they dealt with them. Uh, they went militarily, they went to war with them. They tried on some, at some points to, to understand Judaism, in, in which case they often failed um, uh, to understand a nation that defined itself overwhelmingly by religion rather than in other ways. And it is a way of uh, this, uh, and, and in this misunderstanding or this failure of understanding, we can learn something of the Romans themselves, um, especially when it would come to understanding Christianity and Christians who, do, who saw themselves as what they would call a third race, a third group of people uh, uh, in, in distinction from pagans and Jews. Um, now, in order to start, we should first look at what Judaism was like in the Hellenistic and Imperial Ages. Obviously, Judaism is, from its very outset, is entirely different from all of the other religions of the ancient Near East. Uh, right from the very beginning, it is a monotheistic faith. This is perhaps the most uh, radical difference that one sees from all of the other uh, religions of the ancient Near East of Egypt, of Babylon and, and Persia and all the rest of them. Um, in particular, it is a religion that seeks moral purity in a, to a degree that has no parallel in any of the other religions of the ancient Near East. As we've talked about before with paganism, a person could be an adulterer, a person could be, uh, you know, doing all sorts of other things, a swindler and stuff. And there were, there were gods who were the patrons of those kind of things. Hermes was the god of liars and thieves, for goodness sake. Um, there's nothing, of course, anything like that in, in the Old Testament. Uh, what one ate, what one, uh, how one washed oneself, uh, how one lived their life, all of these things are of in, tremendous importance. The moral purity of a person. Um, that is something that there is no parallel for. Likewise, even in the vision of the creator God that Genesis gives, everywhere else in the ancient Near East, you have att attempts of these ancient peoples to explain how the world came into being, how the, how the universe was created by various gods spitting or sneezing or masturbating or anything like that. Uh, the creation stories of Mesopotamia and Babylon are, uh, are completely, um, well, just what you would expect, you know, fanciful and um, completely, you know, of a, of a very earthly and not to say obscene type. That is, of course, nothing. Uh, there's nothing like that in the Old Testament at all. God simply speaks and the world comes into being. God, as he is envisioned in the, in the Old Testament, is changeless, almighty, uh, and loving, who cares for the individual moral life of each person. That is not to say that, uh, that God cannot, uh, um, that God does not, um, is not portrayed as, uh, as having wrath, or being uh, uh, angry at uh, individuals or nations, but it is to say that there is a deeply personal uh, relationship that is put forward in the pages of the Old Testament, the likes of which there is nothing like in, uh, in any of the other ancient Near Eastern religions, okay? Now, because of that, Old Testament Judaism is a faith that can be carried anywhere within one's heart, and that is why uh, especially after the time of, the, uh, of the, um, the deportation of the Jews to Babylon in 586. Um, uh, uh, th that is why the, uh, Judaism spreads into what became known as the diaspora. And Jews went elsewhere also uh, in, the, in the subsequent uh, centuries. This is, uh, this is again something, because it is a faith that can be carried within oneself, and it is based on a canonical text uh, that can be copied and can be brought elsewhere. This is something quite distinct from anything in paganism that I've been describing, where there are no such religious texts on par with the Torah. Um, in addition, the Jews, of course, would be allowed to return to their homeland sometime around 539 BC under the Persian King Cyrus. 
and the temple, even though the temple is the, is the locus of worship for the animal sacrifices, uh, and, and for the priestly caste that administers the sacrifices to the Lord and that maintain ritual purity. Um, nevertheless, it is possible to live far away from the, uh, the temple and to, and to still maintain an integral life, uh, according to the faith. Now, over time, though, uh, during the late Hellenistic period, there came to be um, a, uh, this, this priestly caste that administered uh, the temple came to be known as the Sadducees in the Roman Imperial period in the late Hellenistic period, and they are those Jews who devoted uh, who are devoted to the interpretation of the Torah, the strict interpretation of the law, the maintenance of ritual purity, dietary laws, circumcision, and all of those things that mark off the Jews from the larger idolatrous world around them. But there were also different schools of thought too that we will. Um, that, that, that we will look at, particularly um, the Pharisees, but that, that will come to in a moment. Uh, right now, I just want to mention that under the kings of Persia and then under Alexander the Great, and really right down to uh, Cleopatra, um, there were rulers within, uh, the, over, the, over the land of Judea that had to come to terms with pagan rulers because starting in the Hellenistic period, Alexander the Great famously brought Greek culture far and wide. And then when he died, uh, the Seleucid dynasty ruled over what is modern day Israel. And um, the uh, and, and so and for all of that period of time, right on up until Roman rule, uh, the Jews of Israel had to uh, had to somehow come to terms with pagan overlords because uh, throughout most of that time they were they were ruled uh, by people who were non Jews. Um, it was a particularly um, I would say not a particularly strategic area. The, the Jewish homeland of Judah, or as uh, the Romans would have called Judea. And the region just north of, of there is Samaria. Um, and uh, these are uh, the, the people in that area of, of northern, um, north of Judea in, um, in Samaria are those who had mixed Judaism in with paganism. They were, they are the Samaritans of the New Testament, uh, whose worship focuses around um, uh, Mount Gerizim, uh, which is just outside of the modern city of Nablus today, uh, the ancient city of Samaria that gave the name this area, the area of this name. Well, the Samaritans were looked upon by the Jews as being kind of uh, as heretics, essentially, uh, because they were descendants of the kingdom of Israel and the various, uh, but also of the various settlers that had been brought in by the pagan Assyrians. So there was always this tension between Samaritans and Jews. And Samaritans maintained a distinct identity well into the sixth century, and they still do, they still do some uh, to some degree exist actually. Um, now, you have to keep in mind that Jews in the Roman age uh, lived in a very far afield, though not just in the um, not just in the homeland, but uh, but had been spread out by for many centuries during the Hellenistic period into that area known as the diaspora, the scattering. The diaspora, the dispersal, um, many of the Jews uh, had left Galilee and Samaria and the Jew Jewish homeland in Judea as mercenary soldiers for these Ptolemaic or other Hellenistic rulers who, who paid money for, for their military services. Jews had an excellent reputation as tough fighters, and many of them served in Hellenistic armies and were subsequently rewarded with land on discharge in Egypt and elsewhere, further afield. And therefore, they set up settlements. And that's true in the Ptolemaic army. It's true in the Seleucid army and those that ruled in Asia Minor. Um, in the diaspora, Jews very quickly had to come to terms with an essentially Greek world, both in language and in culture. And what is interesting, and we're going to explore this later on, is that they accommodated themselves very, very uh, easily, it seems. The Jews in Alexandria, for instance, were a powerful community. Uh, I've already mentioned Philo as a representative of that community. He knew Plato inside and out, as we're going to see, and he could use it to elucidate his Jewish faith. The best estimate is that the city of Alexandria was at a minimum of 750,000 strong by say the year one in the beginning of the first millennium and at least 300,000 of those residents in the city alone were Jews. 
Um, so close to a third of the city. They had a powerful intellectual position in the city of Alexandria. They were very wealthy and they were an important community. In lesser cities scattered in Asia Minor and Greece, communities set up with synagogues and sometimes one is astonished to see how, how accommodating um, uh, the Jews were with the wider world. So for instance, in the city of Sardis, which is the old Lydian capital in Western Turkey today, there has been excavated and reconstructed a synagogue built somewhere between 280 and 300 AD. And it was actually a public building given over to the Jews who were resident in the city, but and it was given to them by the town council. And it looks kind of like a proto church. Um, but what's, what's more astonishing actually is the fact that it's right next to the gymnasium complex um, where in a in typical Greek fashion, men would train and in the nude and do athletics and you know wrestling and discus throwing and working out and stuff like that, uh, swimming. Um, and of course, that probably would not that certainly is not part of traditional Jewish culture. But yet, uh, it was right there, and and there's every indication that those two communities live side by side. Um, and there's no doubt that in terms of intellectual exchange, language and literature would, would, would be studied by the Jews. St. Paul will be a perfect example of this, uh, living in Tarsus, uh, who knew both his Hebrew and, and Jewish scripture, but also had a perfectly um, typical Hellenistic education of rhetoric and logic and, uh, and, and everything else in Greek. So it's also important to stress that what became the Roman province of Palestine and I use that term only in its historical sense. I'm not trying to make any modern day political statement about that. The Romans simply called it Palestina or Palestine. Um, uh, what became the Roman province of Palestine was a very unruly and difficult area to control. Um, and this gets into an issue about what the Romans learned about running the Jewish homeland, about monotheism and, and Christian conflict, I'm sorry, and religious conflict. And we'll all feed into uh, what will happen when we look at Christianity. But uh, it's necessary to give a little bit of background though to understand the Roman setup there and to understand the situation uh, in the years leading up to it. So the Jews had been perfectly capable of, as I said, coming to terms with an overlord who was an idolater, uh, such as the Ptolemaic kings and um, you know, Alexander the Great, the Persian kings. But they were okay with that so long as they did not, those kings did not try to force the Jews to do anything that they didn't want to do. The problem came in the year 200 BC when the Seleucid kings of Syria, and these are Macedonian rulers uh, running the former Asian provinces of Alexander's empire. They're not Syrians ethnically, they are in Syria and Babylonia, but they are Greek Macedonians. Uh, and they had taken over the Jewish homeland and kicked the Ptolemies out of it by that point. Um, uh, that happened in a famous battle in the year 200 in Panium. But now so the problem came at this time because initially the Jews had continued under the Seleucids just as they had under the Ptolemies who had basically been hands off and allowed the Jews to do whatever they wanted to do religiously and culturally. But so the Seleucids got themselves into financial and military trouble. And this then led to a decisive defeat uh, of theirs at the hands of the Romans in the year 190, the favorite, uh, uh, kind of the favored king who was favored to win, I should say, Antiochus III went down in defeat. And from there on, the Seleucid dynasty was in constant um, fiscal and military crisis until finally the Romans abolished the dynasty and took over the area in 63 BC. Um, now, during this time, though, up before then, this is where you have uh, where you have uh, problems because essentially what the Seleucids had tried to do in that during those periods of crisis was attempt to get the Jews to engage in syncretistic worship, that is, worship of the traditional gods. Now, of course, as we've talked about before, the the, the first commandment of the Ten Commandments is I and the Lord thy God, thou shalt have no other gods before me. It was totally unacceptable to worship any other uh, deities. Syncretism, ecumenism, whatever you want to call it, simply was not going to fly. And so there, there, are, uh, there, is, there is a uh, biblical tradition uh, in, the, in the books of the Maccabees, the four books of the Maccabees, that talk about the persecution 
that the um, uh, that that the uh, that the Jews uh, experienced under the Seleucids. Uh, this is when the miracle of Hanukkah took place, um, and also it is when the Maccabee martyrs uh, happened. So these were uh, brothers who uh, were being forced to worship the idols and to eat the meats that had been sacrificed to the gods, and of course they refused to do this, and they were therefore martyred. Okay, uh, one of these later. Seleucid kings who you see in front of you, Antiochus IV, who, who uh, identifies himself as Epiphanes, meaning God manifests, so a lot of humility there. Um, he decided that for the Seleucid state, it was necessary to carry out this active Hellenizing policy uh, in order to win various cities over. Um, and so, so he tried to sponsor cults to Zeus, and, uh, and then he tried to kind of merge that with uh, with ruler worship and and uh, and all of that, and it just just didn't happen. That's where you have that's where you have these problems. And this had never been done before. The Ptolemies had been, I would say, scrupulous in in respecting uh, Judaism. And my suspicion is that the Ptolemaic kings probably admired uh, the ancient faith in some ways. But with Antiochus IV, there was this effort to impose a Greek cult in the Temple of Jerusalem itself, and that action created, in effect, the first religious conflict. Uh, that we have here. Uh, the Jews raised the call for national resistance in 167. Uh, immediately, the Jews flocked to the banner of one Judas Maccabeus, who was at the house of Hashmon. Uh, this is what is oftentimes uh, referred to as the Hasmonean house in English, uh, that came to rule the Jewish homeland after they had kicked out the Seleucids. And in the year 164, the Jews won a significant victory destroying the mercenary army of Antiochus IV, reoccupying Jerusalem, and rededicated the temple. And this is the occasion of the celebration of the miracle of Hanukkah. When the Maccabees did, uh, I'm sorry, what the Maccabees did is not only revive the memories of King David, of the lawgiver Moses, and of course, uh, the great warrior Joshua fighting the Philistines, casting down idols. They actually rose in arms for a national struggle to make sure that the purity of their faith would never again be destroyed by these foreign and idolatrous overlords. And they had won. They kicked out the Seleucids, and as I said, rededicated the temple. And that was a very important defining moment because Judas Maccabeus and his descendants, the Maccabees, not only liberated Jerusalem, but they expanded the kingdom. They brought back in Samaria. They subjected the pagan towns of the coast and colonized the former I'm sorry, the northern regions of Galilee, and Galilee was a tough colonial area of the Jews um, who had uh, uh, been brought up from Jerusalem and were settled there and could be depended upon to defend that, those strategic entrances into the homeland from the north should any Seleucid army ever try to venture south again. Now, during this time, one of the things that begins to uh, that one begins to see is a political interpretation of the uh, prophecies in the Old Testament regarding the Messiah. Now, this is a very uh, very important topic to talk about, obviously, but from the very beginning, this, the ancient Hebrew scriptures make hundreds of prophecies about the coming of a savior that had always been interpreted in a way that would be a savior for mankind, a savior from sin, but which because the Jews had been under these pagan overlords uh, and had these wars with them, with the Seleucids and so on, there began to be an interpretation, an expectation, one might even say, of a Messiah who would be a political ruler, who would be a ruler that would um, restore the kingdom of Israel on earth, and to give kind of a political slash military interpretation to these prophecies. Now, I would like to share some of these prophecies with you, because they are so important. And as I said, there are literally hundreds of them, so there's no point in trying to write these down. Let them just wash over you as you hear me kind of refer to them. I, all of the scriptural um, references are, are, are going to be on the screen, and you can look at them at your own leisure. But these are some of the hundreds of prophecies uh, of what they describe the Messiah will be like. 
there are prophecies in the Old Testament that describe the advent of the Messiah, that he will come. There are prophecies of the time of his advent, of his human generation, that he will have a forerunner, somebody who will come before him to prepare his way. Uh, they describe his nativity and his early years. In particular, we read that his birth will be heralded by a star, that he will be born in Bethlehem, that he will be adored by magi, that is wise men from the east, that he will descend into Egypt shortly after his birth, but return to Israel, uh, that innocent children around the time of his birth will be massacred. We hear of his mission of salvation, that he will be a priest like Melchizedek, who sanctified bread and wine. Indeed, these are some of the most often quoted um, scriptural references by the church fathers. These ones referring to uh, the Messiah as a priest according to the order of Melchizedek, who was not a priest according to the law, uh, you know, the, the descendancy of Aaron. His priesthood came from, uh, it was a unique priesthood. Uh, that he will be a prophet like Moses. That the Gentiles, the non-Jewish people, will convert and worship the God of Israel. Many prophecies about this. That his ministry will begin in Galilee, that he will perform miracles, that he will be God's anointed. And of course, the word Messiah means anointed, as does its Greek translation of Christos. That he will preach, that he will purify the temple in Jerusalem, that he will be rejected by both Jews and Gentiles, that he will be persecuted, that he will enter triumphantly into Jerusalem riding on a donkey, that he will be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver, and that the money gained by his betrayal will be used to purchase a potter's field, that his betrayer will die miserably, that he will be falsely accused, that he will be silent in the face of his accusers, that he will be mocked, that he will be insulted, buffeted, spat upon, and scourged, that he will patiently endure this suffering, that he will be crucified. A, a form, uh, this is prophesied in the Psalms, written sometime around 800 BC, at a time when certainly uh, no, uh, nobody in all of the land of Israel ever had, uh, had knew anything about crucifixion whatsoever. It was a form of punishment first originated by the Persian Empire many hundreds of years later. That he will be offered gall and vinegar to drink. That he will pray for his enemies. That he will cry out on the cross, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That he will die in the prime of life and that he will die with criminals, that his death will be attested by convulsions of nature, and that those who killed him will cast lots for his garments, that his bones will nevertheless not be broken, that he will be pierced, as you can see, Psalm 22, verse 16, they have pierced my hands and my feet, that he will, be, that he will die voluntarily, and that he suffers vicariously for all humanity. That he will be buried in a tomb, uh, the tomb of a rich person. That he will rise again from the dead. That he will ascend into heaven. And that he shall come again with glory to judge the living and the dead. And his kingdom shall have no end. Now, These prophecies, obviously, over time, as I said here, 
uh, as the Jews began to have more and more problems with their pagan overlords, and especially after uh, 167 BC with the Hasmonean revolt uh, and the defeat of the Seleucids, they came to be interpreted more in a political um, capacity and, and for a this worldly uh, sense. And that we're going to see, uh, that will actually, uh, that, will, that is an important thing to keep in mind when one reads the gospels as we will read for tomorrow and, uh, and, as we, and, as, and going forward, okay? Now, the national struggle that we see here was uh, between the Jews and, um, and their pagan overlords was oftentimes seen in apocalyptic terms. And this powerful apocalyptic tradition um, of talking about the final judgment and the end of days, that's really where the nexus came. That's why these, these prophecies about the Messiah came to be seen in this sort of political capacity. Um, now, the Hasmoneans eventually, though, even though they had won against the Seleucids, they failed to keep order. And the Romans were not so um, concerned at that time in the second century as to who ran the Jewish homeland, the whole area uh, that they would call Palestine, all they wanted um, and, and was that there would be no more rebellions. And fundamentally, the Roman interest in the area was purely strategic. Uh, there is this coastal highway. The Romans called it the Via Maris, uh, the way by the sea, and the highway by the sea. And this ran from Alexandria to Antioch in Syria. And the Romans needed to have access to that highway in order to move their military forces. This was their prime concern. So when the Hasmoneans failed to keep order, um, in around the year 63 BC, a certain kind of the, basically the leading man in Rome at that time named Pompeius Magnus, in English simply Pompey, um, he, tr he intervened and he tried to establish Jew uh, the, the Jewish state as a client kingdom of Rome. Um, now that unfortunately did not work out. So what the Romans like to do, they, they had different levels of control. The, the easiest one for them was, was a client kingship. That was where they basically said, look to whatever client king was there, whatever, we'll give you backing for your throne. If anyone tries to depose you, we will back you up militarily and we'll make sure that you have all the power over your local people, but you must collect taxes for us and you must do whatever we tell you to do. But everything else is up to you. All the local stuff, that's all you, on you. That would be the easiest way to handle things. And they tried to do that with the Hasmoneans and it didn't work out. Um, so the Romans eventually turned to a mercenary general who was half Jewish only, known as Herod the Great. And Herod the Great is remembered uh, in both Jewish and Christian traditions as being a very evil tyrant. He was the king who ordered the, 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 the slaughter of the innocents, for instance, in the Gospel of St. Matthew. And um, I'm just going to read you basically a, a, like a short kind of distillation of uh, maybe one minute biography of his, um, because uh, uh, he is important for us to understand, to put, to put the Gospels into their historical framework. If you're following along with the notes, this is on page nine. Um, Herod the Great, born in 73 or 74 BC, and ruled from the year 40 uh, BC onwards to his death. Um, I'm sorry, he began, uh, he died in 4 BC. So his, his date stretched from 73 to 4 uh, BC. He was the son of an Edomian uh, man named Antipater. This is uh, Antipater from Edom. And as an Edomian, Herod was not regarded as a proper Jew. He rose to prominence during the reign of the Hasmonean high priest and ethnarch John Hyrcanus II and brought Judea to its highest political importance and economic development. Our main source for his life and reign are the writings of a man we will learn a lot about tomorrow, Josephus's Jewish War and Jewish Antiquities. Herod first achieved prominence when his father Antipater, the chief advisor to John Hyrcanus, appointed him governor of Galilee. In the same year, he was awarded Roman citizenship. By 41 BC, Mark Antony appointed Herod tetrarch of Judea uh, because of the latter's successful tenure and loyalty to Rome. When Hyrcanus was captured by Parthian invaders in the year 40 BC, Herod escaped to Rome, where he persuaded the Senate to appoint him sole king of Judea. His throne was not secure, however, since the Parthians had placed their own ally, the Hasmonean Matthias Antigonus, on the throne. 
Finally, a Roman force dispatched for this purpose stormed Jerusalem for Herod in the year 37 and, uh, and made him the client king. Despite the intrigues of Cleopatra who coveted his kingdom, he kept Anthony's favor. In fact, there's a very funny story that when Herod, who was such a Machiavellian person, met Cleopatra, who was her own kind of intriguing person. Um, later on, when they each independently were asked how things went, how did the meeting go? Herod said, well, she tried to seduce me. And Cleopatra is recorded as saying, well, he tried to kill, he tried to poison me. And they both were right, Plutarch tells us. So that's the kind of people we're dealing with here. After taking Jerusalem in 37, Herod ruled in relative security into to the year 30 BC, when his primary patron, Mark Anthony, was defeated at the Battle of Actium off the coast of Greece the year before. Herod immediately hastened to Rhodes to persuade the victorious Octavian that he would be an asset um, to his new regime as a loyal and friendly client king, and Octavian confirmed. Uh, Herod's position and enlarged his kingdom. Octavian, of course, this is the future Augustus, uh, restored to Herod most of the cities which had been taken by Pompey in 63. For the next 26 years, Herod provided Rome with a stable and friendly ally um, on the eastern border, kept the peace and promoted the Romanization of Judea. Spiritual and temporal power were henceforth separated. The high priesthood, now Herod's gift, basically, to whoever he chose to give it to, ceased to be hereditary or lifelong. And we start to hear about the Sanhedrin at this point. This was a council of religious elders um, who lost much of its power to the royal council on Hellenistic lines. And the old aristocracy was replaced by a new nobility of office, which included pagan Greeks. So Herod is basically, you know, he's He's secularizing a lot of things here. And as a secular king, Herod tried to promote Hellenization. Athletic competitions were even held in Jerusalem in the Greek style. His sons received the traditional Greek paideia or education. The imperial cult was introduced among his non-Jewish subjects. Several cities were founded or refounded on Greek lines within his kingdom. Lavish gifts, mostly of buildings, and sometimes even pagan temples, were bestowed on many cities outside of it. These policies were unpopular with his Jewish subjects, and neither his championship of the rights of the diaspora nor his magnificent new temple won him their affection. The temple that, that uh, is talked about in the New Testament, um, and the temple indeed that will be destroyed by Titus in the year 70, was the construction of Herod. His power was based on his chain of fortresses, including um, the famous uh, Masada, uh, the, if you're familiar with that, the famous fortress in the, in the country, uh, in, the, in the wilderness. And also on his, his security and his power was based around his Gentile mercenary army, uh, along with his secret police and a centralized bureaucracy, which, with, uh, which he ruthlessly and effectively um, used to fulfill his client king's function of maintenance of the, of the province. There is no doubt that he was able, as an administrator and a skillful financier, Octavian, known as Augustus after the year 27, rewarded such good service with additional privileges, power, and territory. By the end of his reign, Herod ruled over a kingdom that rivaled all previous Jewish monarchies in size, palaces, wealth, and importance. And yet, uh, even though he is, he is best known for all of his building projects and so on, uh, and his renovation of the Jerusalem temple. Um, despite all of these successes, Herod's reign was also marked by a series of domestic problems. His relationship with his Jewish subjects was strained in the extreme throughout his reign. Many objected to his dubious background, as well as his somewhat ambiguous attitude towards Judaism itself. And in addition, internal dissension among his own family caused Herod numerous disturbances. He efficiently and ruthlessly purged the remaining Hasmonean royalty, including his grandfather-in-law Hyrcanus, his mother-in-law, and many other relatives. Now, ultimately after his death, um, there was an attempt to hand over rule of uh, Judea still in this client king capacity was Rome had, I used the term province before, that was a mistake. It was, Rome had not yet made 
uh, this Judea, the province, uh, a province yet. There was an attempt to hand power over to his sons after he died. But they were such inept rulers that that fell apart, and immediately the Romans came in there and um, in, in the year AD 6 and turned it into a full out province with ruled over by Roman governors. Okay, so it was no longer a uh, uh, no longer a client king at all, even you know, a king but independent uh, in some sense. Now it was a full out province of the Roman Empire. The governors, known as procurators, um, were low-level uh, aristocrats known as equestrians. And essentially, nobody wanted the job. <laughs> nobody wanted to be a procurator of Judea because it basically meant that you had washed out of the imperial Roman system. It's sort of like political Siberia or something. It, the place was so remote that whatever happened there really didn't matter to the overall empire. And, uh, and what we're going to see is that Pontius Pilate is a perfect example of such a person. He was basically a washout, basically inept, and um, uh, and and his uh, from all of our sources, both from the Gospels and also from uh, Josephus, as we'll see, he 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 was a very bad ruler and a very bad person at keeping order and things. He was constantly given to sort of dramatic flourishes that um, uh, that that caused all sorts of problems, and he really couldn't hold on to the place very effectively at all. Now, the day-to-day -day running of the province was more or less still relegated to the Sanhedrin in Jerusalem. Remember, that was that council of elders, effectively. Uh, Jerusalem could expand to uh, its population to tens of thousands of people on the great high holy days. And the military presence of Rome was minimal. They had maybe six cohorts and a ala or wing of cavalry. Uh, these were all locals recruited in the area. Many of them came from uh, Beirut. Actually, we have archaeological and, and epigraphic evidence for that. They were generally inept themselves. This was not the cream of the crop by any means. Um, some of them were actually very anti-Jewish. Uh, um, and there was all sorts of ugly incidents uh, that took place between these uh, kind of rough Roman soldiers and their provincial underlings. So the Roman presence in Judea was not very impressive, and it was really a case of misrule on many occasions. And all of this sort of stuff contributed to the great national rebellions that would take place really for the next 150 years. There were, there were quite a few national rebellions. There were numerous incidents uh, in which the Romans mismanaged the province. They did not understand Judaism, as I said before, they did not understand monotheism, really. And so there is an amazing disconnect between Roman law, in which Judaism was acknowledged as a legitimate religion, going back as early as uh, Julius Caesar and Pompey the Great. But there were all sorts of laws allowing the San, uh, and, and I'm sorry, uh, there, and there also were all sorts of laws allowing the Sanhedrin to administer the temple and to administer day-to-day -day, uh, infractions amongst the Jewish people themselves. The one thing that they could not do, though, the one thing that the Roman, and this is typical of elsewhere in the Roman uh, imperial system, was that they could not carry out executions, okay? Even though the Sanhedrin could try cases and could um, determine guilt or innocence for, uh, for, the, for Jews, they could not impose the death penalty. That was something that the Romans reserved for their own right. And of course, this is, this is absolutely um, uh, borne out in the gospels themselves, as we will see tomorrow, when uh, the Sanhedrin tries Christ and then goes to Pontius Pilate and asks him to carry out the death penalty because they themselves could not do it. To the Romans, as I said before, Judaism legally was legitimate. It was an ancestral national religion. Uh, it was peculiar in the sense that there were no images, but there, had, there were rituals, there were sacrifices, uh, there was a priestly ca caste, the Sadducees. And so it did, it did have the, uh, you know, the, and of course it was very, very old in terms of its antiquity. So um, the, uh, uh, so in that regard, there, it wasn't, it wasn't as uh, kind of confusing for them. It wasn't as totally, uh, it wasn't looked at as a new thing, uh, which for the Romans car carried a lot of weight. Uh, we're going to see that over time, 
uh, the Romans will have a great deal of difficulty initially trying to differentiate Christians from Jews. They will mix those two up a lot. But then over time, they will uh, come to be able to differentiate the two. And they will. one of the things that they will hold against Christianity is that it was viewed as a new religion. And new in the Roman mind meant bad. Um, in fact, as I think I mentioned before, the very word for revolution in Latin, the phrase for revolution in Latin is res novae, which means new things. Okay, so you can just tell that that's, uh, you, you know, you can tell that they're, they're highly conservative nature by, the, by such a, uh, a term. Now, one last thing to mention is that outside, uh, um, uh, another group that comes to, uh, comes to prominence within uh, Judaism at this point are the Pharisees. Now, the Pharisees are um, uh, basically, it's kind of like a school of thought, or sometimes referred to as a sect within Judaism here, but it's, it's sort of like uh, they, were, they, were, they were people who had a specifically very strict interpretation of the law, who engaged in all the same, you know, very important rituals and, and washings and dietary laws, circumcision, all of those kind of things. But they had slightly different interpretations than the Sadducees themselves. The Sadducees tended, for instance, not to really believe in, um, in, in, the, in the potential for the resurrection of the flesh, um, which is, uh, uh, or the, even the eternity of the soul, or the importance of angels. These were all things that the Pharisees did believe in and, uh, and, and did hold the importance of. Um, we're, that's an important thing to kind of keep in mind when, when, of course, when we're reading the Gospels too. Now, I do, I think, uh, as, as before, I think I'm going to, I'm going to hold off on a couple of things right now. Maybe let's do this. Let's take a little bit of a, of a pause uh, so that uh, we can come back. And I want to 